There is a sign above our door. I've told you this before. I've showed you this before. There is a sign above our door when you leave our house that is a reminder to us all. You see what that says? Remember, as far as anyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. That's not the sign I wanted to tell you about. There's another sign that's above our, our other door, and it says this. It says, Brotherton, and I don't know if you can see that small print there or not. It says, be true to who you are and the, and the name that you bear. Be true to who you are and the name that you bear. What are you most proud of when you think of your children? I know not all of you are parents. Mike, stretch your thinking here. Okay, you can wrap your head around that imagination. When, when we have kids, what do we think of? When we think of our kids, what are we most proud of? What, are, what do we show off most that we're proud of our kids? And, and as I looked on Facebook this week, I can tell you, it appears as if most parents are happiest when their kids share the same hobbies or cheer for the same sports teams. Because we show that off all the time. Really? Really, I want my kids to uphold my values. I want my kids to make wise decisions, to have solid character, and to hold up the family name well. Okay, this is how you will know that my kids are Brothertons. I don't know, your imaginations can go wild with that. We've talked about this a couple of times before. That if I am generous and kind and thoughtful, that I hope my kids see that and grab onto that and live those things out. If I am Oscar the Grouch, I certainly hope my kids leave that. Above all, as my kids see me spending authentic time in prayer, reading God's word, authentically pursuing Jesus in all of my life, I hope and pray that those values transfer. Be sure that they will always pick up on the things in our lives that are the things we don't want them to repeat. And they do. And they know those things. They see our inconsistencies. But what does it mean? What is it to, to live, to uphold the family name of God? The family name Christian. How do I live the family of God? How do we know we're part of the family of God? Maybe maybe somebody knows you're part of the family of God because you've got this great big six-inch thick Bible that sits on your coffee table. Well, folks, if that's how they know you're a Christian, we're in trouble. That's a good thing. But that's not how people are going to know. I remember years ago, my uncle, who was a missionary in Africa... Uh, before I was married, he came to visit one time and he's walking through my apartment and he's looking at all of the things on the shelves and the things I had hanging on the walls and he's walking around very quietly, just looking at everything, very meticulously. And after he went through the whole area, he said, there's one thing you're missing. What you need right in the middle of this is a big centerpiece picture of Jesus. Because that's how people are going to know. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. If people only find out that I'm a Christian, or if they know about Jesus because I hung a picture on my wall, we're in trouble. You're a missionary in Africa, I said. In a mud hut in the deepest part of Chad. You mean to tell me that you'll go over there and just put a picture of Jesus up? And they're all going to know? Of course. How do people know? How do people know? How do people know my kids are Brothertons? There's family resemblance. There's mannerisms. There's characteristics. There's attitudes. How do we know I'm a child in the family of God? 1 John 2, verse 6 says, by this we know we are in him. Whoever says he abides in Christ ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 1 John 2, 6. Walk the way of Jesus. 
So last summer, we worked all the way through 1 John, if you were here, and uh, we looked at that. And before that, we went through the book of John, and we looked at the life of Jesus. We saw these same things. Again, these last number of weeks, we've walked through several characteristics of what it looks like to walk the way of Jesus. We've looked at um, how to become like him. We can't become God. We know that. But in attitude, in character, in direction, in lifestyle, in pursuits, the way we live our life, become like Jesus. Philippians chapter 2. If you want to turn there, you can. We're not going to stay there long. <clears throat> We're going to go to Matthew in just a couple of minutes. But in Philippians chapter 2, at the beginning of that, it says that we ought to take the same attitude that Jesus had. 1 Corinthians 11, Ephesians 5, 1 Thessalonians 1, other places tell us to be imitators of Christ. So let me ask you, what things come to mind? When I ask you, what, what, is it, what are the attitudes of Christ that we should own? What, what are the characteristics of Christ that should become a characteristics of us? What are attitudes? To, to walk in the way of Jesus, what are those things? Call them out for me. Sorry? Humility. Love. Yeah, for sure. Mercy. Goodness. Joy. Peace. We could probably go for 10 or 15 minutes, and, and, and this is an, an, an unending list of characteristics. There are so many. We need to become as Christ demonstrated. We need to obey as Christ taught. We need to follow as he led in his way. In, and interestingly, when Jesus died and rose again and ascended to heaven, and the new church started, that new church, as you know, many of you know, was called the way. It was called the way of Jesus. That's, that was just the natural thing that they called. And that's what I'm calling us to over these last six weeks. To live the way, to walk the way of Jesus. We looked at consecration, to set myself apart for God. We looked at faith, to trust him wholly. To sometimes we need to just step out of my safe zone into that trust. We looked at commitment. What am I really committed to? My life and my priorities will show that. We looked at sacrifice, and how we regularly sacrifice without even thinking for the things that are our highest values. We looked at stewardship, and the world and everything in it is God's. Everything I have, including my kids, are His. They're left in my care to be a steward of His things. We looked at prayer, partnering with God in the things that God is doing. All of these things, and the things you said in humility and peace, and love, and these things are the way of Jesus. Now, are there some of these things that we could put aside and say, well, that's not really as important as this? Is there any of these things we could say that I, I will strive after and become this and this and this? Mm, not that one. Uh, no, there isn't, right? Because all of this is the pursuit if we are following Jesus. These are the way of Jesus. If I call myself a follower of Christ, these are my life pursuit. I think the way of Jesus. I imitate the way of Jesus. I walk the way of Jesus. I serve my king. I take the attitude, like Philippians chapter 2, to be the same of Jesus. So in, in that chapter, Philippians chapter 2, what is it in that, in that chapter that is the dominant characteristic of Christ that we are to imitate? Do you know what it is in, in Philippians chapter 2? It says, have the same mind of Christ. Servant, exactly. That we should be a servant. The heart and life of serving. The heart and life of serving. Now, in June a year ago, uh, 2016, in our Why We Do What We Do series, we looked at serving. And I gave you at that time three motivations or three contexts from Scripture about serving. We looked at the body of Christ, and Jesus is the head, is the command center, and we all function together as one body. 
We looked at the family of God. As we are brothers and sisters, he has made us children of God, co-heirs with Christ. God is our father. And we looked at the kingdom with one king. And we are subjects to him. We, we are all co-equal underneath him, and he is the king. And, I, and I'm not going to go into great detail about that, but that's the one I want to kind of pick on this morning and, and bring back to our memory. Colossians chapter 1. If you want to go to Colossians, if you have your Bible, um, I just want to read a couple of verses. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 says this, In giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And I love this verse, verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Rescued, delivered, qualified, transferred into the kingdom of light. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 tells us to seek first the kingdom. Above all else, seek the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 8, just a couple of pages later, he, he talks about the kingdom again, and he says we are subjects in the kingdom. When we think of a king and a, and a walled city, and we are subjects under a king, we understand what subject means, right? It means we're not the king. We're under him, right? And we serve his will and his direction and his desire because we're subject to that. There is only one king. Where this all breaks down is when we try to become that. We try to regain control, authority, and power. But living in a kingdom unifies us because there's one king. He is our king. He is king of my life. That comes with protection and leadership and governance, expectations, safety, uh, unity, purpose, cooperation, all of these things that come by living within the kingdom walls comes with privileges, it comes with responsibilities, and it comes with hardships. Probably the biggest hardship is, I want to be in control. <laughs> the number one acknowledgement of living in the kingdom is, I bow to his will. He is the king. I submit to his authority and his leadership. He calls the shots, not me. What would it look like if there was a kingdom where um, nobody was king? It's not a kingdom, right? I don't know if you're a fan of Monty Python, but years and years ago, I spent way too much time watching Monty Python sketches. And there's one sketch where the King Arthur comes along as he, in his travel and sees a king or a, a castle, and he stops the people there and says, whose castle is that? Well, we don't have a king. We're an autonomous collective. Think about it. What is an autonomous collective? A bunch of absolute individuals living our own dreams and our own pursuits, and we just kind of come together here. And he says there, the man says, we take turns acting as executive officer for the week. But none of our decisions in that week, all of our decisions of that week, have to be ratified at a special meeting every other week. Right? Nothing's ever going to happen. Right? Are we an autonomous collective with our own pursuits and our own directions and our own thoughts? That's not a kingdom. And that's not church. We follow the king. He is my king. We are subject to him. And we serve him. So get this. When I know my king, I thrive as a subject to him. When I know my king, then I know his love, and I know his grace, and I know his mercy, and I know his justice. I know his salvation. This is the nature and the character of my king. When I know my king, when I know my king loves me, and I love my king, I change. What are the defining characteristics of this kingdom? 
The nature of this kingdom is love. The nature of this kingdom is mercy and grace and truth and generosity. Clearly, this list goes on and on and on. But what is the heart of this kingdom? Jesus shows it over and over and over. The heart of this kingdom is the heart that puts serving ahead of the self-interest because of love. So let's zero in on what Jesus taught about this. Go with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus uh, is with his disciples, and one of their mothers show up. Two brothers, the sons of Zebedee, their mother shows up, and, uh, and is looking out for her sons. Matthew 20, starting in verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him, that's Jesus, with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked for something. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said, say that these two sons, it's my boys, say that they will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am going to drink? And they said, we're able. I don't think they had any idea. I don't think they had any idea what was coming for Jesus. We're able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup. Right? They died gruesome deaths. You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but is for those whom the, has, has, it has been prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard that, They were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him, and this is what he said. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their their great ones exercise authority over them. It will not be like that among you. You these, These guys were following Jesus, and at this point they still thought in all of their best understanding that Jesus was going to establish an earthly kingdom. They would overthrow the Romans, that he would be on the throne. And guess what? We're right with them. Authority, power, influence, wealth, all this is coming, right? And Jesus says, verse 26, it will not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want to be great. I want the seat of importance. Jesus says you want to be great? Be the servant. God's economy is upside down to ours. You want to get to the front of the line? Hang out at the back of the line. Everyone else goes first. Be the last. Be the slave. What is Jesus teaching here? What is the attitude? What is the characteristic that we ought to be imitating? That we ought to be coming like? What attitude, lifestyle, priorities is the way of Jesus here? Look in verse 27. There's a word there that in this translation, the English Standard Version is translated slave. At the end of verse 27. And in your, in your version of the Bible, it could be a different word. But that original word written there in Greek is the word that should be translated bond servant. We don't have bond servants. We don't have slaves much. But in our world, we understand servants. We understand slaves. A bond servant is very simply this. It is a servant or a slave that for whatever reason had been freed. They could have purchased their freedom. They could have been granted freedom, but they were free to go. You are no longer a slave. And this person, for some reason, says, no, I'm staying. And I will make a commitment for the rest of my life to serve you willingly. They would pierce his ear as a sign, as an indicator of that. And they made a lifelong commitment to that master. That's a bond servant. Now, my nephew, Josh, was about eight or nine years old, and 
he wanted to get his ear pierced. And his mom said, no, eight years old. He went back and did some work. And he came back a couple of days later and said, Mom, I want to pierce my ear because I want to show the world that I'm a bond servant to Jesus. Because that was the mark. It was a pierced ear. I still don't think she let him do it. But I'll never forget that. Why in the world would a slave that was released to freedom, why would he stay? Only if he really loved his master. What is the only motivation for walking the way of Jesus? Only for love for him. If I'm motivated as these folks were in so many ways by personal gain or by comfort or profit or me, I have missed the entire picture of Jesus. Here is the way of Jesus. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all. He must be the servant of all. That's, that's Mark chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus is teaching about the same thing there. And interesting, here he uses the word must. Hmm. Whoever wants to be first must be last, must be servant. And that's interesting because as I went back and studied this again in the Greek, there is no way to really translate that into English without it being a full paragraph because the word that we have in our Bible, must, is the Greek word exist. You want to be first? You must exist as a servant. Everything about my life, every moment of my life, to live there, last servant. That is interesting. If anybody wants to be first, important, lead, win, you need to live at the back of the line. You need to choose the worst seat in the house. You need to choose the worst time slot so that somebody else can have a better time slot. Jesus himself modeled this. Here he is, the king of the universe, the creator, God himself, becoming completely human. And what does he do? He serves he actually serves and he has his followers and he kneels down at their feet and, and washes their feet as a servant. You don't do that. He's demonstrating this. He is the only one that deserves to be served. He deserved, he's worthy of it. And it's, it's like the king comes out of the castle in disguise to walk amongst his people and actually serves them. How many movies have been made about that? I wonder where they got the storyline. Go to that passage, Mark chapter, chapter 9. Just a few pages over. Mark chapter 9. The disciples here are talking, and Jesus gets into the same topic as he did in Matthew chapter 20. But at this time, they're on a journey. They're walking to Capernaum. And they got there. They got into the house. And he asks them, What were you discussing on the way? They kept silent. Because on the way, they were arguing with one about another about who was greatest. How many times do you think Jesus needs to teach this? <laughs> Why do you think Jesus has to teach this multiple times? Because this goes against everything we are as humans. It's a different economy. It's a different way. Human nature hates being a servant. Look at what he says here. The first will be last. The servant is tops. In our culture, in our society, what job would be the lowest? You don't have to say it out loud. We all have our ideas, right? What would be the lowest of the lowest job? The job nobody wants. What would be the highest, most respected, most dignified, most brilliant pursuit? I don't know why and how in our society today that somebody who could just be a goof off in front of a video camera and post it can make millions and millions of dollars. And we have teenagers growing up and their life pursuit is to be a YouTuber. This economy is out of whack. 
Many of you have been to Haiti. And when I went a year ago, when I was going down there, I did some work to kind of process my mind and learn about this country a little bit and understand it in different ways. One of the things I found out about Haiti is no one will be a farmer. That's the lowest thing you can do. The lowest thing. They would rather sit unemployed and poor and starve to death than farm. Think about Haiti, the land they have, the location they have, the climate they have. They have no export of food. There's no export of coffee. No one will be a farmer. And and we know that that country in desolation and poverty, if they would farm, they could feed their people. It's so beneath them, they'd rather sit on a chair and die. That economy is broken. In God's economy, who is the highest? It's the servant of all. Really? A servant. Whose economy do we live by? Who do we live for? Interesting side note this week that I found. Uh, when, when, When they came to Jesus and said, what's the most important thing? Jesus gave them two answers, these two things. What are they? Love God, love people, right? As I studied serving from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible this week, as I looked at it, there was constantly two contexts for serving. Serve God, serve people. I never drew that connection before. Love God, love people. Serve God, serve people. Serving is the way of Jesus. So, the question, how, where, when, who do I serve? Who is the king of me is the underlying question underneath that. What is my motivation? What makes me say, I'm a sermon of the king ready to do his will? We sing that. If I want to be first, be last. If my motivation is to be first, then that's for my benefit. And I've missed the point. If I want to be first, if I want to be heard, if I want to be control, if I want authority and power, then we're in the wrong seminar. (laughs) Because that one's down the street. This kingdom is about surrendering my personal rights. This kingdom is about handing over control to my king. This kingdom is about giving up my driven pursuit for success and for self and for worth and handing it over to my king. Why? Why in the world would I join something that asks me to surrender all of my own personal rights? Unless, unless I knew my king. Unless I knew my king. When I know my king, and I know my king loves me, and I love my king, when I know my king, everything changes. I've shown you this video before. I want to show you again, and we'll wrap up. Noah, can you put that video on for us? He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? 
He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You see, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah. Yeah. When I know my king. Consecration, we talked about six weeks ago. Yes, I'm there. Faith, yep. Sacrifice, service, stewardship, prayer. Yes, 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 yes. When I know my king. If I don't know my king, all of this is lunacy. But when I know my king, I change. To have the same attitude of Jesus. Philippians 2. Not to desire equality with God. Power, control, authority. But servant, subject, obedient, surrendered. Because I know him. So, two years from now, a year from now, When all the dust settles, I know some of you are thinking, let's stop talking about the campaign, and in a couple of weeks our services can get back to normal. Some have been very frustrated with the last month and a half, but let me tell you, the last month and a half for many in our church have been the most significant leg in their spiritual journey. God is doing great things, and when all the dust settles, Let's walk in the way of Jesus. One heart, one spirit, forward together. Together in what? In walking the way of Jesus. That's all. Forward together in following Jesus. Our lives transformed. Authentically living a life of consecration. Authentically living a life of faith, of sacrifice, of selfless serving. This is how our world will know. They will see the family resemblance, the character, the priorities, the work, the passion, the heart of Jesus in us and through us because we walk the way Jesus walked. Because I know my king, because he is making me more and more like him, 
and then through me, by his Holy Spirit, changing our world. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, King of kings, Lord of lords, we are your subjects. But we are your children. Thank you. Break us, melt us, mold us, and use us. And as we sang before, change my heart, O God. May I be like you. So God, my my heart's desire is that we would be like the apostles all the way through the book of Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and all the epistles over and over and over they refer to themselves as servants of Christ may that be our lives you have made us stewards of the mysteries of God may we steward that well Because you are our king. Because I love my king and my king loves me. In Jesus' name.